Hey y'all, welcome to Professional Development Bootcamp Day Two. Woo, woo, woo. I see you coming in the room. Come on in. We're gonna have a great conversation this morning. Inspire you, get you all hyped up and ready to have your best possible day, week, year at work. Happy New Year. Okay, so we got some of the participants that are already here. Do me a favor and go straight to the chat. Tell me what your morning beverage is. Like, what do you drink in the morning? What's your coffee order? And then, so Kendra knows who she's talking to. Tell us where you work and what you do. Go to the chat right now and tell us. And we'll have Kendra looking in the chat so she'll know who she's talking to. For those who don't know me, my name is Corey Joe Biddle. I'm the executive director of Fuel Milwaukee. Now, Fuel Milwaukee is an affiliate of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce, where I also serve as VP of Community Affairs. So thanks to MMAC for their immediate and constant support of professional development boot camp. This would not be possible without them. So by now you probably know that professional development boot camp is a multi-day virtual conference focused on career development for Milwaukee professionals. We used to do this in person when we could do it in person. And it was five days, three workshops a day. So a total of 15 workshops, 15 different locations. So virtual has its challenges, but it's not nearly as exhausting as in person. But I will be honest to say, I miss you guys. I really do. I, I miss seeing you and feeling your energy, your in-person energy. When we were doing this in person though, most of the sessions would sell out and we would max out at like a thousand registrants. We're at like 1700 res registrants right now. So um, I don't know. It's like, I miss seeing you in person, but I kind of like the fact that more people have access to the content and information. So thank you all for supporting what we're doing, for spreading the word. Between now and Friday, there are more workshops for you all to participate in. And they're all scheduled around your work schedule. So you don't have to miss PTO or miss any work. And thanks to our sponsors and speakers and community of em employers, this is completely free. The virtual version is free to everyone. You don't have to be a field member. So spread the word. There's even some people from outside of Milwaukee that were on a couple of webinars. <laughs> so feel free to, to share the love. <laughs> you can consider this your gift from the business community. All right. Now, our sponsors. This also would not be possible at the level that we've been able to do it without our sponsors. Marquette University has been our presenting sponsor for several years and they're back again this year. I'm so appreciative of them returning as presenting sponsor this year. The Graduate School of Management is home to nationally ranked MBA and executive MBA programs, as well as world-class master's programs in these areas. Accounting, applied economics, corporate communication, finance, management, supply chain. They also have graduate certificates and they have joint MBA programs. So you can have an MBA joint with the concentrations of law or political science or nursing. That's pretty cool. If you're interested in any of those programs, check them out. I'll drop the link in, uh, in the chat. You can also Google Marquette University Graduate School of Management and you'll see that little screenshot is their homepage. So once you see that, you know you're there. All right, returning as a supporting sponsor is, <clears throat> I haven't had my tea, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <clears throat> American Family Insurance. The high note was a little difficult today, but it'll be better this afternoon. <laughs> AmFam is well known for their corporate responsibility efforts and their passion for coming together with customers, employees, and agency owners to drive positive economic, social, and environmental change for our communities. And we've all seen their presence and deep roots in Milwaukee. So thanks to AmFam for all you do for Milwaukee and for supporting Bootcamp. Check them out at amfam.com. New to the Bootcamp family as a supporting sponsor is Mandel Group. Mandel has luxury apartment communities throughout the Metro Milwaukee area, including downtown, Shorewood, West Dallas, Wauwatosa, Brookfield, Hales Corners, Franklin, and Oconomowoc. If you've ever been, if you live in a Mandel property or you ever visit a friend in one, you can, they're, they're really pretty. Put it in the chat. They're really beautiful, good, great spaces. So if you're looking for a new place and you want it to be beautiful, scenic, great neighborhoods, you can pick 
go to mandelgroup.com. Check them out. Lastly, our returning media sponsor is Radio Milwaukee. Through music and stories created for a culturally open-minded community, 88.9 Radio Milwaukee is a catalyst for creating a better, more inclusive, and more engaged Milwaukee. Be sure to tune in to the radio station at 88.9 and visit the website, radiomilwaukee.org. All right, the reason why we're here is you. We want you to be comfortable in this space. Make sure you play with the controls and figure out the view that's right for you. And the chat is yours. Take over the chat, okay? I want you to go in the chat. I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to Kendra. I want you to talk to each other. React to what you're hearing, what inspires you. We really appreciate that interaction. And listen, by now I know you guys are not shy. <laughs> You're not shy. Make sure though, when you go in the chat, if you want everybody to see the comment, set the default for everyone to see it. Otherwise it will only come to me and Kendra. The last 15 minutes of the discussion, we will take your questions. Um, it's easier if you put them in the Q&A section. So you see right next to the chat, you see the Q&A. If you have a question that you want us to see and discuss, on camera, put it in the Q&A. If you're just kind of chatting and interacting with each other, feel free to do that in the chat. If you do happen to put a question in the chat by mistake, my colleague Stephanie is in the chat moderating, so she'll still be able to catch it, but it's easier for us if you go to Q&A. Got it? All right. Why are we here? Kendra Whitlock Ingram is amazing, and she's the president and CEO of Marcus Performing Arts Center. I always want to call it the Market Center for Performing Arts. I want to call it the PAC. I, want, I mean, come on. We, we, when you're a Milwaukeean, a native, you've been in the game with this performing arts thing a long time, right? But it is under a uh, new, new brand, new leadership, new name, and we're going to find out all about it. Not a new, well, new to me, but it's, not, it's been that name for a while here. Let's talk about Kendra a little bit. Now, she's a nationally recognized performing arts leader. And she's the first woman to serve as president and CEO of the Market Center. I didn't know that until um, I started to do the research on you, Kendra. Yeah, that's true. The first, uh, only five CEOs in our history. Wow, okay. She previously served as the executive director of the University of Denver's Newman Center for the Performing Arts, where she was nationally recognized for the caliber of new programming. I'm excited about the new programming that she's gonna bring here the depth of community engagement, I'm excited about that too, and the financial health of the organization. And I'm sure the organization is excited about her skills in that area too. She was um, also the vice president of programming for education at the Omaha Performing Arts Center. Um, she has also held leadership roles with the Shenandoah Conservatory, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, Detroit Symphony Orchestra, Phoenix Symphony Orchestra, and the Tulsa Philharmonic and a bunch of other stuff. I mean, her I could not fit her bio on here. So I just wanted to hit the high points, but she's amazing. And we're going to learn more about her. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for doing My this. My pleasure. My pleasure. So exciting. I like your energy, like at eight in the morning. Like that's, you know, in my business, this is like, we, we're not up this early. We had a show last night. We had opening night for Mean Girls. And What's yeah, it, so we, how long? Well, how long the, the the last show when does it start and when did it like when did you guys get out of there uh i got out early because i left with the audience so 10 okay. um but you yeah. know uh everybody else is <laughs> there for a minute yeah uh, yeah, yeah I can, it was fun i can imagine so i was uh my kids have to be at school at 7 30 i know and it's a high it takes me a minute to get there so I have to will myself every morning <laughs> to have the energy to do anything because I'm a night owl. So it's like, I like to stay up late. Right. What about you? you yeah. I mean, obviously you don't mind staying up late. I don't, even though I will say I've kind of gotten in the habit of going to bed early when I don't have an event. Um, so like nine o'clock. Uh, yeah, because I do like my sleep too. Yeah, I know. You need to sleep. I mean, the older I get, the more I'm enjoying sleep. Tracy mm -hmm. Campbell said she had friends that were at the show last night and said it was amazing. Tell us a little bit about it before I start as before I start asking you questions about your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the show is uh, Mean Girls Musical. It's based off the film, um, and it's it's a pretty good representation of the film. Uh, it's so fun. 
Um, I laughed out loud multiple times. Um, cast is great. Um, sets look great. Like it's, it's really a fun show. Um, and it's selling really, really well. So if you want to go get your tickets, we have good availability tonight and Sunday night. Um, there's avail like scattered availability throughout the week, but tonight and Sunday night are probably the best avails. So, um, but yeah, it's super fun. It's, and we're lucky we are the sole sur Wisconsin survivor of the show. Um, it was supposed to be in Madison and Appleton the two weeks before us and it canceled. They had to cancel because of COVID mm. uh, in the past. So we were like, Whew. <laughs> that is, I know, right? Jeez, Louis. Like, and you were already scheduled at this, was it scheduled at this time or was it a reschedule? Oh yeah, no, it was scheduled at this time. Yeah, so our shows, like shows oh, like this book out like a year in advance. Well, more than a year in advance, actually. So when, when did you start at the Market Center? March 9, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and what, and what, what day did we go into quarantine? Uh, March 14, 2020. Can you believe that? It is so crazy. So were you crazy. not in, uh, in your in your industry? Were there any whispers? Like, did you have any clue? Did you hear rumors that something was going on, or was this a complete shock? It it was a shock. Like I think for everybody else, I think the thing you know, like everybody else, uh, we thought, oh, we'll just be closed for like two weeks, mm -hmm. and so we'll just reschedule, like reschedule, reschedule. And you know, this happens. Like things happen in our business where you know, a cast member gets sick or, you know, something happens technically in the show and we have to reschedule. Um, I never in a million years would have thought we would have been closed for 14 months, like completely closed. Welcome to Milwaukee. Ooh, <laughs> right. What a, I mean, geez, Louise. And you can't, you can't. for the ages. You were in Denver before this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So tell us, we're going to go all the way back. Okay. To the beginning. Tell us where you grew up, and I want to know about your family, if you have siblings, what your neighborhood was like, mm -hmm. anything that's, that stands out. All right. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, so first of all, I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, which, you know, it, for all of our friends on the call today, a home of the office, um, and of course, Joe Biden. Um, even though I grew up on the west side of Scranton, um, uh, West Scranton neighborhood, um, Joe Biden grew up in Green Ridge, which is like a different neighborhood. So like if it were Milwaukee, um, the west side would be like, I'm trying to think what the west side would be like. It's like the Italian neighborhood, um, a lot of like Italian stores, grocery stores and restaurants. Um, and then Green Ridge, Green Ridge would be like Shorewood. Um, so like, I, I can, I don't know what like a comparable neighborhood would be in Milwaukee, but it's, it's Scranton's really similar to Milwaukee in a lot of ways. I, I feel like, I think that's why I was drawn to this city because it has a lot of neighborhoods. Um, it has a lot of, um, ethnic cultures that represent certain neighborhoods. Um, and it has that kind of small town feel, even though it's a, a city like Scranton is a small town. It's only 100,000 people, but it's really close to it's two hours from New York, two hours from Philadelphia, six hours from Boston, five hours from D.C. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Doris said maybe Brady Street. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, I think that really Brady Street area is definitely like east side it would probably be like like West Scranton. Um, and, but like that vibe, like neighborhood bars, like a bar on every corner. <laughs> and, you know, um, I grew up uh, three doors down from the Boys and Girls Club, um, where I spent like pretty much my entire youth. Every time I, I meet someone, when I met um, uh, Kathy, who runs uh, Boys and Girls Club here in Milwaukee, I'm like, you know, I was a club kid, right? She's like, you were? I'm like, oh yeah, I, I lived at the Boys and Girls Club. When I started, it was the Boys Club okay. um, in 1981. And, uh, you know, girls weren't allowed. And then they opened it up to girls, but they still called it the Boys Club. And then, uh, and then it became the Boys and Girls Club. So yeah, so I grew up like three doors down from that. Um, uh, my, my parents, you know, uh, civil servants, essentially, like my mom was an art teacher in public schools for 30 plus years. Oh, my dad was a social worker for, um, 
minority vets at uh, the Veterans Administration in Wilkes-Barre, which is down the street from Scranton. Uh, so, so yeah, so I had a great growing up there, really loved there. And I think one of the cool things about Scranton is that, and I have a brother, a younger brother, he's two years younger than I am. Uh, he lives in Dallas area now. Uh, the cool thing about Scranton is because it's so close to places like New York and Philadelphia, like our school trips, like the way you guys would probably go to Chicago, we would go to New York. So I remember seeing shows you know, like there's no big deal. Like, and, and this is so weird too. I don't know if this is you, uh, Corey, you may be a little younger than I am, but um, when, when they would do our school trips, you know, there was a bus trip to New York. They drop us off at like 42nd and Broadway. And they'd be like, okay, we'll see you for the matinee at two o'clock. And <laughs> I just think about that now. And I just can't imagine like, like schools doing that. We but, went to, um, I remember we did the, we did a trip when I, I went to, go to my ear for oh, uh, uh -huh, yeah. elementary school. We would walk from Golda uh, to the PAC. Those were some of our most fun trips. I think about that now and I'm like, there were so many of us like out in the street. It just seems like, but we did a bus trip to Chicago uh -huh. and we went, they took us to a mall and they just let us loose. Totally. <laughs> totally. Like, I, I think about that. Um, oh, what year was that when they dropped you off 42nd Street? Like, uh, 90. Like, you know, like it wasn't, it, you know, it, I think Giuliani had already been mayor, which is so weird to think about, too, because like back then, like we actually thought of Giuliani as like kind of like a good mayor. <laughs> like, can I say that? I care. I'm not going to get political. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but like, you know, uh, certainly in the eighties when my parents and my brother and I would visit my auntie who lived in uh, Greenwich village, uh, like where Juilliard is in Lincoln center, that was like, not, like upper West side was not a good area. Um, and now it's like, you know, pottery barns and <laughs> anthropologies and stuff. Um, but yeah, like, uh, so yeah, like, you know, late eighties, early nineties, they drop you off 42nd street and be like, we'll see you at the theater. Um, at two o'clock, you know, and I remember buying a fake Gucci watch off of someone like on Broadway um, that that lasted for like at least six or seven years. I think I feel like I wore it through college. Um, the bet, listen, the watches, the purses, the knockoff fragrant body oils. I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't get better. Totally. So like, you know, that having that experience of being so close to New York and, and Philadelphia was like, just, it's like the best of both worlds because I had that small town experience growing up where, you know, again, you can go anywhere and like everywhere was safe essentially. And, um, and then like really close proximity to, you know, some of the world's greatest cities um, mm -hmm. to experience. Like I saw, uh, Les Mis when I was in high school, like the original production. I saw um, Cats, I saw Miss Saigon. Um, yeah, it was just a really, it was a really great uh, experience. Do you, Nessa, if this, if we were doing a movie about you, right, <laughs> they, would, they would show you little teenage Kendra sitting in the theater and the camera would pan down on you and you would be inspired and all of these things would be mm, going through mm -hmm. your head and you could see the future of your career in the movie version. But what was it like in real life? Like, did you realize that you, you were, this was a special connection or did it happen cumulatively over time? Well, I was always a theater kid. You know, I was the orchestra kid, uh, played violin and viola in, in uh, all throughout, you know, school. And then I, that was my major actually in college. Um, I was concert master of the orchestra. I was definitely um, uh, a leader type of kid. Um, okay. And, you know, watching Mean Girls last night, actually, it's so funny we're having this conversation because I was thinking about this watching Mean Girls and like how hard high school is now for that like because Mean Girls is after me like I was the Heathers generation um if for all y'all who know Heathers the, the uh, movie um uh, Winona Ryder was in it um they made a musical of that too which is really quite funny yeah. but it's very dark um <laughs> but uh yeah like like how like high school is always hard for every generation but like how much harder it is with social media and like 
uh, the over-sexualization of girls, like that's very like prominent theme in the, in the, in Mean Girls. And mm -hmm. like, that wasn't as much, maybe it was, and I just didn't like think of it that way, but I had a, I was really um, not like a, a joiner kind of kid. Like I, was, okay. I had friends in different areas, like, you know, um, I had my theater friends and I had my music friends and then you know, friends that were kind of artistic like people who weren't into music at all, but you know, maybe visual art or writing. Um, had some friends who were athletes, like, um, so, you know, I kind of, um, but I always saw myself in uh, some sort of arts, you know, okay. I, I'd say okay. I was, I'm a musician by trade. I was, I was, of course, the lead in our school musical. Oh. Um, <laughs> I was in Gypsy, <laughs> you know, that musical um, uh, made famous by uh, Ethel Merman on Broadway, but. Uh, and you, so you, it, you sing, play instruments, like the whole shebang. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was pretty good actor, I would say, you know, I went to governor's school, that was another thing in Pennsylvania. Um, it's like a summer school for kids in the arts. And I went to governor's okay. school for theater actually, and not for music, which is kind of funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was always in the show, but the funny thing is, is cause somebody asked me this not too long ago, um, would you ever see yourself in this role? And I think like everything in my life has led up to me being this, like, I, I never really, I liked being on stage for certain things, but I really liked putting it all together. I was more really? of a producer, even in high school when I was, a uh, when I was, um, a junior, uh, I wrote a composition for violin and string orchestra for this co this competition, this like art state arts competition, and I I said to my mom, I'm gonna need to record it, and I want to do it in a recording studio. And she's like, Okay, we'll find the studio and see how much it costs, and then we'll talk about it. So I found the studio. I got the, a rate. I talked to the guy about a rate. This is what I can afford. Um, and then I hired all the musicians. I said I can pay you with pizza. We have a rehearsal at my house at this time. And then so like everybody shows up and then like after we do the rehearsal, we all schlep downtown to the recording studio and uh, and, wow. you know, I'm like setting everything up and um, the recording engineer is like, OK, you know, let's do a take of it. And he's like, C come back and listen to it. And I'm like, no, that's, you know, can you put more reverb on this, that? And, and everyone's like, what is she doing? <laughs> So I was kind of always that kid, right? Like, and, and in high, in college, the same thing. Like, I directed a couple shows, um, some musical reviews, and uh, I was in student senate. Like, I was that I was that kid that was always kind of doing stuff. So when I found out that like this is actually a job that like people get paid to yep. do this, um, to put shows together, I'm like, wow, this is what I've been meant to do my entire life. You know, I came into uh, the business through orchestra management because that's what I kind of knew. I knew classical music probably better than anything. Um, and I always, strangely enough, I always thought of theater as somewhat impractical uh, <laughs> as a career choice. But like music is so practical. But, you know, I was going to teach, uh, you know, yeah. high school orchestra. Like I, I knew, you know, that was a career path. I you could see a path for it, right? Yeah, because like, my mom had much, done that. How much did your mom being artistic and teaching how much did she influence you i mean very she, much so yeah because I, I imagine so. your house there were a lot lots of music and art and just creativity going on in the house so so interestingly my mom uh you know was I, I wouldn't call her a musician but she played instruments she played cello she played piano um and she loved classical music like she loved opera she loved classical music my dad's an athlete um, you know, he was a basketball player in college, uh, was drafted to the NBA in the 60s. Um, and really? uh, yeah, and I was like, I always wanted to be in athletics, but my mom's like, you're going to break your fingers. And then how are you going to play the piano? I'm like, oh, my God. Um, so it's funny because now, like, my fun time is being an athlete. Um, and my dad and I kind of bond over that a little bit. But uh, anyway, my dad and my mom, were very different people. And, you know, my dad never really wanted to go to concerts or shows or whatever. So my mother, like there was no like Peter and the Wolf or Peppa Pig for me. It was like, we're going to go to see here the Pittsburgh Symphony play Rachmaninoff and Beethoven. And like, that was my, 
<laughs> that was my like kids cultural activity. Like, so it's funny. I, I think about that also. And I really give my mom a lot of credit because, um, you know, she did it also for herself because she loved going to that and she wanted a, a plus one, as we say now in the business, uh, to go with her to shows. So I saw a lot of um, artists very, very young. Um, you know, famous violinist, it's a Perlman, famous soprano, Kathleen Bell, who I've now since worked with. And I remind them, you know, I saw you when I was like eight years old in Scranton, Pennsylvania. They're like, oh my God, I can't believe. I'm like, that it's really so, is so full circle. It's like, yeah, it's like every, you were just set up, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. So mm -hmm. what in the, in the chat, the participants go to, go in the chat, tell us the last show, uh, performing arts, anything that you've seen any city, anywhere. Put it in the chat so we can all see. Um, yeah. So when you so coming from those teenage years, going into college, where did you go to college and what did you study? So uh, you know, I knew uh, th this was also something that I organized. Like my parents are incredibly supportive. Like my dad was like he would organize all the trip details. Like he'd go to the AAA and get the trip dick maps to like go. <laughs> <laughs> to plan our trip to uh, okay. Pittsburgh or Ithaca, you know, my college visits. So, you know, I would, I would tell my parents, okay, I'm going to, um, I want to apply to this school, this school, and this school. Um, and then, you know, I would do all the stuff um, and uh, coordinate the, um, the auditions or whatever. So um, I went to, I auditioned at a uh, uh, Bucknell University, which is kind of like a, like a semi-Ivy. There's a lot of those kinds of schools on the East Coast, uh, semi-Ivy in Pennsylvania. Ithaca College, also semi-Ivy, like um, the sister school, the um, Cornell, um, and a big, big music program. And Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, where I ended up going. And I like Duquesne because um, I really like the idea of being in a bigger city where I'd have like access to um, more nationally touring things. Um, and just like, I, I felt like I wanted to be in a big city kind of long-term. So it was, it reminded me again, reminded me a lot of Scranton, but like on a much larger scale and had access to other things. So I ended up going to Duquesne. I was a music education major. Yeah, uh, Pitt, all right, right down the street. <laughs> Um, I like seeing your show choices. Uh, Hedwig. Oh, I love that show. That's a great show. Uh, a lot of Hamiltons in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I heard uh, Dad's season tickets was actually really great. Um, but yeah, so I uh, went to Duquesne and I was, like I said, I was planning to major, I majored in music education. I played viola. So this is another like uh, hustle that I had going on when I was in high school. So I was a violinist by trade. Um, I really, I really was a violinist. Um, and I switched to viola, which is very similar to the violin. It's a little larger. Um, it's a little lower pitched, uh, because there aren't as many violas, um, in most programs. Like there's always like a lot of violins and pianos, flutes, but there aren't a lot of violas. So somebody had said, oh, you know, you should, you should switch to viola. Like you would, you know, it might, might have more opportunities for you. And I'm like, can I get scholarship money to do that? Because <laughs> I, I, right. I played piano better than anything, but um, piano is very, very competitive in college. Like it's, you know, you have to be really, really good to get scholarships. So is um, it true? Like, is it true that if you, my father played the saxophone, he, he, when I was little, I took piano classes because he told me if I learned to play piano, I could, it would be easier for me to pick up other instruments. hundred percent. Yes. And I played piano yeah. first and I would say, it's, it's interesting now, you know, going through college, how much easier my undergraduate experience was because I played piano. So as a music education major, you have to play everything kind of at a meet some sort of proficiency, right? So, you know, you take classes in woodwinds and strings and you have to take several years of piano proficiency. So like for me, you know, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So like your music teachers in high school, like they have had to learn, like, I had to be proficient. I had to test my proficiency in trumpet, flute, clarinet, um, uh, trombone, really proficient in piano. Like you had it, four semesters of piano. Mm -hmm. um, uh, strings, they kind of gave you a pass because strings is really hard to learn um, to become proficient at in a short period of time. Like, and by proficient, meaning like I know fingerings, I can, 
you know, get a sound through the instrument. I can play a small thing. Um, and, uh, but piano, you have to be very proficient. You have to know chord structure. You have to be able to accompany to a certain extent. So there are a lot of my friends, particularly voice majors who were not proficient in piano. Ooh, they struggled. Like it was mm-hmm. like a real struggle. Cause like, it's like learning a language, you know, when you learn a language as a kid, it's a lot easier, you know, than learning a language when you're 19, 20 years old. Um, so, so yeah, so I was, I was very advanced because I had played, I played piano very well. I mean, I could have been a piano major, but, uh, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't good enough to, to get a scholarship. So I switched to viola, like, a, like, I, I want to say between like somewhere in junior year. And then I put together over the summer an audition for viola. Like I could barely read the clef. Like the viola is a different, it's not like uh, the same clef as like, it, the music reads differently than violin. Okay. And so I had to learn that. And then I basically just learned it so I could audition. <laughs> so I could audition. And of course they're like, oh yeah, we need violas. We always need they violas. need it, yeah. Yeah, okay. and I'm like, you know, I'm not gonna be a professional musician. I'm gonna be a, a teacher. So I just wanna be able to play an orchestra. I don't care if I play violin or viola. Um, and then, so that's how, you know, I ended up being a viola major. So when people say, oh, you played viola, I'm like, yeah, I did, but I, I won't, I wouldn't call myself a violist. I what do like you play that. now? And if you, if the participants, if you play an instrument, put it in the chat, let's see what you guys play. I always think about doing like a, a fuel talent show. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Because, the, because you would be surprised the stuff that people know how to do. <laughs> like, I agree, right, Totally. What totally. do you still yeah, play now? A, and flute is hard, man. Ooh, I, I, I came real close to failing that flute proficiency. Um, and, and same with trumpet. Trumpet was real hard for me too. For whatever reason, I was really good at trombone and, and double reed instruments, which are usually kind of challenging. But, um, but yeah, I, I would say if you put music in front of me right now, like I have a piano right here, okay. um, I, could pl- I could play you know, reasonably well. Like I could, I can read music. I can, I can basically sight read, but I'm, I unfortunately I'm not at the level of <laughs> wanting to perform for anybody, nor, nor would I ever, like that is not even an interest for me. Like that's much Cause better. you're the behind the scenes. So, what, so you graduate from college thinking you're, you know, at this going in thinking you're going to be a teacher. Yeah. Graduate. Is there an internship, a mentor? Like what happens? Like what, so, what happens? Somewhere in the middle of my degree program, I learned about this world. Um, and one of the women who was a graduate student at um, Duquesne was working for the Pittsburgh Opera. And she's like, you know, maybe you should look at doing an internship. I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I can get like college credit for that. Yeah, that's like a great elective. So I did this internship um, with the Pittsburgh Opera and I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Um, I heard about something, same thing for orchestra, which was my kind of wheelhouse. And um, there was this fellowship program that was meant to train um, executive directors, essentially, of orchestras. Um, It was a really big program uh, in the 80s and 90s. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. It was kind of expensive program to run. Um, But a lot of the CEOs and executive directors of major orchestras today came out of that program. So I, I spent basically my, my summer of my junior year going to my senior year doing some um, professional work, you know, working as an assistant for um, a music festival in Texas. Then I worked at Glimmer Glass Opera for a period of time um, and, you know, kind of building up a, a resume uh, to get into this program. So uh, right before I graduated as, as outstanding music education student of <laughs> the year decade, um, I ended up uh, getting accepted into this fellowship program, which is kind of funny because it took me completely off. Like I was taking all my tests to be certified in Pennsylvania and as a teacher. And, and then like this happens and essentially what happens is they send you to three different orchestras in completely different places around the country where you um, shadow the CEO for um, three months. So I was assigned to, and I had never like been west of the Mississippi. Like I had never been to the West Coast. I had like not traveled really past um, uh, the Eastern part of the country. Um, So they sent me to Oklahoma City Philharmonic in Oklahoma, um, the San Francisco Symphony and the Grand Rapids Symphony in Michigan. 
um, like three very different orchestras, very different talents. And it was like the most incredible experience um, that really launched me into working, you know, in management for orchestras, which I compare to people as kind of like being a, a, a general manager of a sports team. So that was my most of my role in the orchestra business was, you know, uh, orchestras are union, are professional um, unions. And uh, so like, you know, management negotiates with the players union on contract, uh, very similar to like sports team, like, you know, play, you, the coach hires a, um, the coach along with members of the team hire uh, players in, in uh, orchestras. It's the same for the audition process. And then after they win the audition, they come to the general manager and the general manager deals with all the contract. And like, this is the deal, like this is what we pay you, here's your benefits, whatever. Um, um, and it was awesome. However, the orchestra business is a very challenging business from a, uh, and I, I saw a lot of your, uh, your jobs in the, in the chat. Uh, the business model doesn't exactly work. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of supply and not as much demand. So, you know, in order to have an orchestra, you have to, you have to pay people, you know, a real salary. Um, and then like when you're paying a hundred people, like a pretty good salary and benefits, like you want to work, you want to have them play a lot because like you're paying for that. Like even mm -hmm. before you turn on a light bulb, you got to pay, you know, the orchestra. So, so orchestras end up putting out a lot of concerts. And as we know, like you can't, there's not necessarily maybe the demand for all that, all those concerts based on, you know. What do you, you think, it, it, do you think that that's in the way that we are like our American culture, we're just not going to orchestra or not talk to or not try, like, is there just not an appetite or enough of an appetite for it? Like what could make the business model work or is it time to just transition to something different? Well, that's a really good question. You know, I think, you know, there's definitely, I would say in Europe and Asia, um, there's a little bit more of an appetite for like the fine arts and not just orchestras, but ballet, classical music, you know, traditional theater. Um, and they're all government subsidized because the government mm -hmm. feels like it's a big part of what people do. But it's also like, it's not just for older white people, um, which has kind of been the stereotype of what, you know, classical or fine arts, um, performing arts is in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you'll see young people, like my husband and I, we went to uh, London a couple of years ago and we went to Royal Albert Hall, which is massive venue. I think it's like four or 5,000 seats. And uh, one of my favorite conductors, Esa Pekka Salonen, was conducting uh, one of the Lon London Symphonietta or London Philharmonic. I can't remember. One of the London orchestras. They have multiple. Like, that's, you know. <laughs> um, and we're like, oh, you know, you can buy, like, $10 tickets or whatever. And so uh, we went. And this place was full. Like, and it wasn't all old white people. It was, like, young people. It was older people. It was people of different colors. People were standing. There's, like, it's like an arena. So they're like in front of the stage, there's like a mosh pit essentially. And people are just standing there like for two hours, drinking beer and listening to classical music. I'm like, really? this is what, yes. I'm like, this is what it should be. Wow. It's not like this, like, oh, I have to be prim and proper. And, da -da -da. and it was just amazing. I was just like, wow, this is so different than the way it is in this country. So, you know, to answer your question, like, I think uh, you know, all of these performing arts organizations, like in addition to putting on concerts, we should also be like contributing to the community in some way. And I think the orchestras that do that best and, and all of our colleagues here in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Symphony, um, the ballet, the opera, uh, the rep, they all have a community engagement element of what they do. So, but I think, you know, to really like make ourselves relevant to the community, um, we have to invest more of our artist time in that work than just putting on concerts in our tuxes mm. and you know like the formal going out on stage playing the gig like I, I feel like that's going to have to evolve because the way we consume entertainment is evolving um and that's you know it, it's not it it's just not going to be feasible to 
to expect people to do to do anything 26 weeks out of the year. Right. <laughs> you know, even if like if there were Packers games 26 weeks out of the year, would we go to every single game? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Like there's hardcore people that go to the Brewers every game. I know there are people who do that, but like even that, like you know, you kind of pick and choose. I want to do a little Broadway, I want to that's do right. a classical music, I want to do a Brewers, I want to do a box, I want to do this. So that's kind of the way people are these days. Um and their time is limited. So I feel like you know, we have to adapt our business models and the performing arts to really be diverse in what we offer. And what's the, what's the, what's the conversation like with the executive leadership and like the, the community of your peers when you're talking about doing non-traditional things that are a little, you know, you talk about people, you know, drinking a beer and you know, right. I, I can imagine that there are some purists or like classic, classic oh, form yes. people that really get uncomfortable with that. Uh, what does that look like? What are those conversations like? And do you, are you like one of the rabble rousers? Well, the- you know, it's kind of funny. Like I always, I think in classical music, I always felt like I was a little bit of a square peg in a round hole, which is eventually why I left. Um, I still love the art form. I still love going to concerts. I, I go to the MSO. I, I'm planning. To, I, uh, I'm giving a big plug for the MSO uh, next weekend. They're doing um, uh, a really cool program as part of their 30s festival. So I would I, I would check that out if you're if you haven't been to their new venue. It's like one of the most oh, stunning concert halls I've ever seen beautiful. in my life. It's um, stunning. It is stunning. Like, and I've been to a lot of concert halls around the world and it is, but it is truly like one of the best. So um, big plug for the MSO, but for me personally, you know, my interests were very diverse and like, I wanted to be able to do things that are outside of the kind of classical canon. Um, I really love dance, jazz, world music. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I found performing arts centers, I'm like, oh, you mean there's like, again, like this kind of awakening of, oh, you found this thing um, that uh, is for, um, that has diverse multidisciplinary performing arts, where you have the flexibility to have all kinds of arts in your facility and serve as kind of a home to you know, local arts groups and nationally and world renowned touring artists. Um, and like, it doesn't feel as, as restrictive. So, you know, to kind of answer your question, like what's the vibe, you know, in the performing arts center world, I think it's all about how are we relevant to the community? How are we making sure that we reflect the community? How are we ensuring that the programming that are in our walls feels inclusive and that like, you know, even at the Marcus Center, I mean, I'll be the first to say I've heard from people, oh, it feels like I don't know what goes on in there, or that's a place where only white people go to see shows like, you know, I've heard those things. And, and, you know, that perception is something that I think all performing arts centers around the country, you know, everyone from the Marcus Center to the Kennedy Center, which is like, I think one of the most inclusive venues in the country, and they had that same thing because like people perceive like what they are as like a certain type of thing that you have to get dressed up to go there. And, That's right. You know, I think I saw someone say, I hesitate to go cause I'll fall asleep or, or it's going to be boring or like they, you know, they have this perception of what it is. And um, I think our goal is to constantly be um, creating an inclusive and inviting place where you, where you know, you can see Mean Girls one night and then you can go next week and you could see Florentine opera do, you know, a Spanish chamber opera that's like, man, I never even thought I would want to do that, but that's kind of cool. So yeah, I think it's breaking down those walls. Um, Like growing up in classical music, there's so many rules. There's so many unspoken rules and I just don't have time for that. (laughs) You know what I mean? We were um, preparing uh, when uh, at Goldemeyer, I remember Mr. Horowitz was our uh, teacher. We were going to the orchestra and we had like a, a session beforehand where he told us all what to do, what not to do. And it intimidated me. But once we got there, it actually made me feel like I, I felt like I was equipped. <laughs> like, like you're I an knew, insider, right? Yeah, like I knew when to clap or when to like, wait for her right. to turn around before you, you know, I felt like, okay, we know what we're, what we're doing. But I don't know. I mean, we ha- I had that one conversation in school. If I hadn't gone to that school, I don't know if we would, ever would have been going to the Performing Arts Center if we would have been having any conversations about it. Now I look at like um, 
like the hip hop, hip hop ballet stuff, like hip play and things yeah. coming yeah. out of some of these other. And that would be a no brainer for my kids. Like they wouldn't feel intim- They would want to see it. So yes. like, what has been the role of diversity behind the stage and on the stage? And really, because in the business world, we always talk about everything is getting more and more brown. Yes. Yes. And more and more diverse. <laughs> and how, how we, do we bring that representation to the workplace? But it's got to be the same in the arts. Hundred percent. And just like the, you know, um, just like the corporate world, the arts, like we think we're so woke and we're so like, you know, uh, progressive and this and that. And in my business, performing arts, major performing arts centers, there's a consortium of about 70 of us. uh, There are only 13 percent of us that are in the C-suite, you know, black and brown folk um, or any people of color, Asian you know, Latin, like there, it's, uh, it's just, it mimics corporate. Um, And, uh, you know, one of the things I've been really focused on, and you and I've talked about this, is it wasn't until I came to the executive director and then CEO role, that I'm like, why didn't I do this sooner? You know, and we need more people of color in leadership making roles, uh, in leadership roles and in decision making roles. Um, and so that we can really influence what the programming is and what our, you know, our goals and mission are. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think the arts is working on it. There's challenges. Uh, you know, we, again, I, I'm picking on classical music, but, you know, my business is commercial theater, Broadway. Uh, you know, I serve on the Broadway League board. I'm a Tony voter. Um, and they got the same problems. <laughs> It's not like, oh, you know, commercial theater, like it's, you know, people want to buy tickets to it and it's really popular in selling, you know, um, making money. But, uh, you know, the, the the idea of black and brown folks as producers and um, folks um, who are, you know, uh, in director roles or investors or, again, CEOs like myself running regional arts centers, like, there aren't that many of us. Um, and that's like one thing I'm really, really focused on right now is I'm, we're, we're actually the consortium of performing arts centers. We're starting a fellowship this year, very similar to the one that, um, that I went through 25 years ago in the orchestra business, um, specifically to drive uh, people of color into C-suite positions, CFO, C- particularly CEO, CFO, and chief advancement, because uh, those are where we're most underrepresented. Um, I know we got some questions in here and I'm like, no, wait, I, let me, I'll do the, I'll do the question in the Q and A and then Stephanie, I'll ask you to, um, after I do this Q and A question, pull the questions from the chat. So we have like, if we do like 10 minute rapid fire of questions, you guys post your questions and then we'll, because some of them are deep, but we'll got to get through them, uh, rapid fire. So we can touch on a lot of the content. This is some of the, ju- y'all asking some juicy questions. Okay. Doris wants to know, um, how do you and your staff pick and plan the programming? Ooh, and also how, how do you and your staff decide what other community organizations to partner with mm-hmm. that can um, help get a variety of people in the door? Yeah, really good question. So most of my career, uh, both in the orchestra business and performing arts center was it had a programming element, um, which I was just saying to our programming director yesterday, I'm like, Man, you have like the best job in the organization. Everybody wants to do what you do. You get to pick what comes in. And I, I argue that um, as the programming director or VP of programming, what a role I've held in several places, uh, it's almost better than performing because you get to determine like the best in the world to come mm. to this space. So how do we decide? Um, there's a bit of, it's a bit of formula and a bit of, um, you know, it's quantitative and qualitative. <laughs> Uh, just like any other business, you know, we look at, we particularly in Broadway, it's very like, you know, based on sales history, uh, average ticket price. Uh, we, I look at sales data all the time, literally daily. Um, other markets, um, how are shows selling in other markets, comparable markets to us, you know, what is their subscription load in versus single tickets? Like, so the, all these like kind of quantitative factors for commercial theater play a big role in that. Now, of course, we also want variety, you know, like um, uh, shows that just came off Broadway, Tony Award winners, uh, shows that, um, you know, are, uh, uh, 
you know, revivals, like, a, you know, like, let's have one revival and uh, three right off Broadway, one Tony Award winner, like best musical. Um, and then there's shows that are in the hopper that like cycle through every multiple years, like Hamilton is on a two year cycle right now. I think Lion King's on a five year cycle. Wicked is typically on a three year cycle, even though COVID's kind of screwed all that up. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so like it's, it's actually much more um, analytics driven on the commercial side than it is artistic. On the artistic side, and then we present like the, the what we call our mission-based programming and that's, it. and that's very much based on who are the audiences we're trying to attract. Um, you know, like next week we have to, to our conversation, Black Violin, which is a classical hip hop duo, um, violin, viola actually, uh, and hip lay. Uh, we have Ballet Folklorico de Mexico coming next uh, two weeks from now, which is a world renowned um, folklorico okay. company. Uh, so like, it's like, okay, you know, what are the communities we want to serve? What are the p potential um, engagement activities we can do with, with community partners? So those are mission-based and those typically do not make money in ticket sales alone. So we have to fundraise to support those types of programs. Almost all of them are like that. Broadway also helps to subsidize a bit of that. Um, yeah. But we are a nonprofit, like, you know, even though we have commercial programming, um, it, we're, as, as, as you all know, nonprofit doesn't mean it's not a business. It just means that we, instead of, you know, paying our investors, we pay back um, our dividends to the organization to invest in more community-based programming. So um, it is a formula, it's a bit of a formula. And then like sometimes opportunities just pop up too, you know, um, you know, you'll have a show that I'll be like, uh, I remember when I was in Omaha, uh, a promoter came to me and said, what do you think about presenting Neil deGrasse Tyson? And I'm like, yeah, let's just do it. Like, it was totally out of nowhere. Same with Jane, uh, Jane Goodall. So uh, one of Jane Goodall's um, colleagues said, Jane want, you know, wants to come to Nebraska to see the migration of the cranes. And, um, you know, she wants to test out, you know, some of her new um, lecture material. And I'm like, we're happy to host Dr. Goodall. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you kind of just have to go with the flow too. Um, but it is, it's pretty much a formula. Someone, Katarina, how do you think artists representing unions would respond to requiring that artists contribute? in different ways than just performing? It's a it's a very tricky conversation. Like, I think it depends on the discipline too. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a classical musician, we are stuck in a little box six hours a day practicing our instrument. And we're told that, you know, the measure of success is to land an orchestra job that pays you a six figure salary and full time benefits and, and retirement benefits. Like, so when you're trained to land that gig, it doesn't, there's not a lot of incentive necessarily, at least in the way the conservatory model is currently to train to also be a, a contributing human to society um, and to give back with your art. So it's not to say that there aren't a lot of musicians who do that. And I would say even a lot that are professional orchestra members or professional musicians. But at the end of the day, the goal is to be technically excellent. Um, so I think in order to like, you know, how do we, how do we, um, how do we have artists respond to in that way? We have to make that part of the equation of being an artist uh, from the very beginning and not just being technically excellent but also like, what are you doing with that talent? Like, what are you doing with the art? What do you have to say? How are you contributing to the world? And I think some of the greatest artists do that, um, but we don't train for it. Um, and we don't, um, we don't socialize it in, um, in becoming a professional artist. Yeah. Uh, Nancy wants to know what are a few tips to being the incredible organizational leader that you are? <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, you know, I would say I, I, I would I don't know if I'm an incredible organizational leader, but I will say the one thing that I've embraced um, and I have an amazing staff and board here at the Milwaukee Center that also embraces that is that I am myself who you see today. Uh, and on this panel today is like who you would see at a donor meeting, who you would see on stage, who you would see and like, you know, meeting about budgets like I'm and who you'd see. Um, at the beer garden at Estabrook, like I am not, I don't 
change. I don't code switch at all. Like I, this is who I am. I am my authentic self. And, uh, I really have embraced that. Um, for a long time, I felt kind of hindered um, in my early part of my career, particularly as a female um, and particularly as a female of color um, in a very white dominated uh, East or Western European traditional classical art form <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, where that was not very welcome. And I've kind of found my tribe uh, with, uh, with this. Uh, and I, I really, really encourage um, colleagues or people coming up in the business that you can't, you can't compartmentalize who you are. You have to be who you are all the time. All of it. Um, and I, I've really embraced that um, in the last couple of years. So I, I would, that's, that's what I would offer. Um, uh, and, and I think that makes you feel more um, engaged in what you're doing as well. Amelia is a, do you, I don't know if you've, um, Amelia Bercy, you gotta meet her. She's another uh, oh yeah, artist. for sure. She's awesome. Really sweet. She wants to know: Are your fingernails inspired by Mean Girls? Either way, hundred percent. They're fabulous. Well, you know it is. <laughs> you know it is. So uh, of course, I uh, had to get pink this week for Mean Girls. I also wore pink for opening night, but Wednesdays where we we wear pink. If you remember the show. Um, so tonight there'll probably be a lot of pink. I, I actually did buy pink lipstick recently too, which I did not own. But um, yeah, of course, you know, I bought my, you know, I got my nails done for Mean Girls. Got to coordinate. Okay, Jeff <laughs> said. I told you my authentic <laughs> self is right up in you. <laughs> Jeff wants to know, uh, do you see people like Lin-Manuel um, influencing youth, BIPOC and um, other people who have been alienated from the fine arts to consider pursuing careers in performing arts? Like, I wonder what the impact that he's had um, and how long yeah. do you expect that ripple effect to last? You know, uh, I will say definitely Lynn manuel is an inspiration, um, you know, for, for Black and Brown folks in leadership um, in the arts. But I would also say um, the murder of George Floyd was a, a big transition um, for the arts community. I think more so mm -hmm. than I would have ever expected. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of my colleagues now like again, being their authentic selves and bringing their whole self to the to the work, and you know, not uh, apologizing for it, um, and that has been in a lot of segments of the performing arts industry. And I would say, especially in commercial theater, I've been really impressed um, with people embracing that, um, mm -hmm. and white people embracing that and saying, you know, um, this is this this is a part of how we're going to succeed as an industry. Um, I think one of the things that like my friend who's producing a, a play on Broadway right now, unfortunately, it just closed because of COVID um, called Thoughts of a Colored Man. He was telling me some stats of his shows. He's like, this show ain't cheap. It's not like, you know, this is making money. People are coming from all over the country to see this show from Texas, from Florida, um, um, Black people spending an average ticket price of 85 to $90 mm -hmm. um, to see this show. And he's like, it's not just a like, you know, a uh, progressive idea to be a more inclusive business. It's actually good business sense. And it's, we're making money for the industry. Yep. Um, and I think that's something that's like really been, uh, that's why I think commercial theaters embrace this so much is because they're like, oh, uh, like we, like this is like gonna affect our business. <laughs> so yeah, so that's people, that I mean, great. they will spend money it just I mean I think yes. about when color purple came out this oh month. totally my mother-in-law grandmother -in -law, I mean like it was like 10 of us flew <laughs> out there just to yep. it was like that and we didn't care about the money it was like we just wanted 100%. to see it. it was just, 100%. yeah yeah the so representation like, big deal. that it's it's a big deal on so many fronts um and it's gonna keep the industry alive I think mm -hmm. um in the long term Edwin asked the question. He says, how do we get traditional ethnic musicians to come to perform in Milwaukee? Uh, Sona Jobarth, am I pronouncing that correctly, is an example of a woman who is the only world woman chora player. And she would be a great person to bring to encourage young women and girls of color to enter this world of art. I have not seen a lot of ethnic musicians at Summerfest and we'd love to see more and other Edwin, other you are singing my song, no pun intended. Is I literally just had this conversation the other day. Like it's 
you know, I think one of the things that's a gap in Milwaukee that we as the Marcus Center can really serve is uh, filling that world music and traditional arts um, space of, again, world renowned touring artists that sometimes miss the market. Like you'd have to go to Chicago or St. Paul or Minneapolis to see these artists, Lady Smith, Black Mombazo, um, coming in uh, uh, March, uh, Ballet Folklorico de Mexico. And, and some of these other, there's a lot of artists that are younger also that are in, in uh, combining like contemporary music with traditional, like a traditional uh, mariachi or, um, you know, traditional folk art. Um, that we need to like we need to bring these folks to like I think the Marcus Center is a place for that um and I think you're going to see more of that this is the very first season that we're, we're we've shifted this model of, into more presenting primarily because the symphony moved to their own venue and um it created a little more uh availability in our space yeah. to, be able to bring that kind of um artist you know we there just wasn't the dates on the calendar to do it before so i think you're going to see a lot of that um keep your eyes peeled for that uh particularly as we announce next season in the next few months um there's going to be some really cool stuff coming so as thank we you for that thank you for that um that uh point though that's a really yeah good i mean there's there's a good a good mix of folks, and I love the questions that are coming. And what I love about what I love about programming is that every speaker and every topic, like fuel, fuel is a huge network, but it, uh, we bring out these subsets of people <laughs> that are like super passionate about stuff. I'm like I had no idea. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I just love it. Uh, okay, as we close, when you think about you know you're in Milwaukee and you just like we got it. We got to get you meeting people and get, you know, because this is hard because when you come mm -hmm. through COVID, it's like, but you got a great personality and you're going to, I mean, people are going to love you. Okay. We got to get you, get you out. <laughs> Not to, but we also got to get people in to see some more shows. What audiences do you think are just not, like we, we're missing that audience. We got to get more of this demographic in. And do you have programming or plans, uh, volunteer programs, like whatever it is that you have to get us more involved as a community? I would say, you know, uh, two things. One, definitely, you know, looking to see more of uh, black and brown folks come to the Marcus Center regularly for programming um, and not just ethnic world music programming, but like everything that we offer, uh, Broadway, mm -hmm. opera, ballet, and making sure that they feel like this is like, uh, again, and then, like, I don't know, need to know when to clap um or like or I don't need to wear a certain thing um you know to be at the venue but honestly the other big demographic that uh I we need to do some work on is millennials and and uh gen xers like we don't it's kind of like a lot of on the the boomer and upside and kids you know okay. um first okay. stage does an amazing job I see Nancy on here um you know, with, with kids uh, coming to the venue, but that like my generation and the millennial generation like tends to be um, not who we see as much. Um, you know, a show like Hamilton brings out a little bit more or, or uh, frankly, I Mean Girls or, um, you know, Wicked. Uh, but uh, yeah, Fuel Field Trip, yes, yes. I will curate the show for you even. Yes, um, okay. But I think that's, you know, I think that's an area that we're looking to do. You know, we do have, I tell people all this time, and, and I think we talked about this, um, we, a lot of our ushers are volunteers. Mm -hmm. And that is a great way to see a show for free, <laughs> is to volunteer as an usher. It's a, it's a really good um you know way to uh give back and also uh to if you love seeing shows like it also exposes you I hear from ushers all the time like that I wouldn't have necessarily gone to that show and I'm so glad I worked it because yeah. like, I experienced something that I hadn't before so yeah if you're looking to volunteer um definitely go onto our website marcuscenter.org um and you can learn how to volunteer to be an usher like that's uh, a really cool thing to do and and I, all of the arts groups have that um have volunteer ushers so it's not just the Marcus Center you can you can do that yeah Rebecca seeing Mean Girls this weekend great uh you'll love it it's fun thank you so much for doing this it's been great to you know the last time we talked it was briefly but I'm like I want to know more about just how you got here and what that path has been like and we're just really so fortunate to have you be a part of 
um, our community now. So thank you for coming to Milwaukee. Oh, it's my Our pleasure. Team. We love it here. My husband and I love Milwaukee. Um, we feel like we found our home here. Uh, love the Marcus Center and can't wait to see uh, more of y'all down at the, at the venue. Um, keep those recommendations for shows coming, Edwin. Yep. Thank you for that. Like, ser- I'm not even kidding. Like, if there's something you want to see, uh, let us know because that uh, that does influence um, what we bring. So, yep. uh, and and Corey, thank you for just being awesome, a great interviewer, and uh, for running this great program. Appreciate You're it. You're so easy to talk to. So this makes my job <laughs> easy. So uh, we will be sending up uh, the recording of this, and I'll send links to um, the website, and so folks will get connected. Let's get some volunteers, y'all. Let's let's go volunteer. Let's just, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Let's represent fuel. All right, all right. Thank you, Kendra. Thanks, everybody. All right, Get everyone. Back to work. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. Bye guys. Thanks for being here.